Good afternoon. I'm Richard Ammons, not Joe Swimmer, as probably the name on my picture states. I'm Vice President of the Board of the Episcopal Parish Network, and I want to welcome you to this program on Earth Day, talking about the state of climate advocacy. The conversation today will be led by Joanne Hansen of the Church Investment Group, and I will turn the program over to her to introduce our other guests. Again, welcome and enjoy the conversation. So as we celebrate Earth Day today, one way that we can honor God and our faith tenets is by caring for God's creation. So it's my pleasure to introduce you all to the work of Influence Map, which is a nonprofit data analytics firm and it'll share uh, the analysis of the good news and the not so good news in addressing the climate transition. The framework for this discussion is that climate change is a pressing issue, which needs to be addressed in corporations' operational plans and in companies' and investors' assessments of climate financial risk. I'm Joanne Hansen. I'm the president of the Church Investment Group, we're a nonprofit that works with Episcopal and faith-based endowments to do profitable faith-based investing and to think about the real-world impact of our investments. Sharing their insights today with us are going to be Kendrick Haven, who is Influence Maps Director of Projects, and Cleo Rank, who is a Senior Policy Analyst. I've asked them to share the work that Influence Map does and the role that companies can play in adapting to changing climate, but also to discuss the ongoing active role that companies, trade associations like the Chamber of Commerce and the State Financial Officers Foundation are undertaking in actively undermining transition policies. We'll leave time for uh, questions at the end, so please put them in the chat so we can address them after Kendra and Cleo have shared their thoughts. And with that, I will turn it over to Kendra and Cleo. Thank you so much, Joanne and Richard for the introduction. We are happy to be here with you all on Earth Day. I am going to share screen for our presentation. And I hope you all can see that. So again, I am Kendra, Influence Maps Director of Projects. I'm just going to walk you through our agenda today, um, and then we will start off. So first, I'll overview Influence Map, what we do, who we are, kind of the broad view, bird's eye view of how we track corporate climate lobbying. And then I'm going to pass off to Cleo, who will overview the anti-ESG origins, targets, and pushback with some reasons for optimism. And then I will wrap up with additional reasons for optimism on Earth Day, including some trends in best practice and in encouraging reasons for optimism that we are seeing as we assess this space. So Influence Map, as Joanne introduced, we are an independent nonprofit think tank founded in 2015 around the eve of the Paris Agreement. We're global with offices um, across Asia, New York, London, and we have two main programs. The most prominent program of ours in our flagship program is called Lobby Map. That's what Cleo and I will be speaking to you from. So Lobby Map is a large database of companies and industry associations. And essentially what we are doing is tracking everything that those companies and industry associations are saying and doing when it comes to climate policy. We started out small, um, about 10 maybe companies in 2015, and we've grown to about 500 companies now globally and 150 industry associations that those companies may or may not be linked to through membership. This image on the bottom here is the essence of what we do, what we do and what we believe at Influence Map. Um, understandably and rightfully, a lot of the discussion has focused on companies scope one, two and three emissions. And a lot of companies communicate on that part of their business plan. What are they doing to decarbonize, to reduce emissions? How are they seeing the net zero transition? 
At Influence Map, we think that a lot of times a company's lobbying, or what we sometimes call its scope for emissions, can have an even greater impact on emissions than its own operational plan. And that's why we track a company's lobbying. So across this massive database, there's so many different types of entities. And what we can start to see is that all of them have what I consider almost like a superpower. You might think that an individual company has a little bit less of an impact than a massive trade association, but sometimes it's those companies that carry particularly close relationships with a certain policymaker. So we might see, for example, a big utility that's providing power to an entire state meeting regularly with that state senator. And that's a close and kind of personal relationship that can have a lot of influence for better or for worse. There are also what we see, they're called astroturf groups. And you may have heard of them or seen them and not even realized what they are. An example, if you are like me, based in New, in New York, would be New Yorkers for Affordable Energy. They're industry-funded groups that kind of pretend to be representing the community. And so they have a lot of power because they're speaking as if they're for the people, but really they are company groups that may or may not actually be representing the best interests of the people. There's um, different groups of companies that sort of band together around a particular issue at a moment in time. And I'm kind of, as you can see from this triangle here, going from the sort of small to the large. And then we have trade associations that are sector specific. So for example, you may have heard of the Edison Electric Institute, which is a national trade association that represents the utilities or electric power sector. And those are really influential because they are the experts. So Edison Electric Institute can come forward and say, we know this sector more than anyone else, so you should listen to us when we are commenting on this federal rule that impacts our sector. And then even bigger from there, we have these cross-sector or massive industry associations, trade associations, like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And these are more powerful than all because they are essentially claiming to represent the entire national economy. All that being said, when we look across our database, it's the industry associations that across the globe in every jurisdiction really are the most powerful and the most negative on climate. Interestingly, they are often a lot more negative than the companies that they represent. And that's sort of a phenomenon that we can get into a little bit later. All of the companies are also linked in our database are linked to the trade association that they seem to be a member of. So what we'll do is we'll look at a company like Apple and we'll look at, okay, who is Apple actually a member of? Um, not the US Chamber, but maybe Business Roundtable or other groups globally. Another interesting thing that we see is that of our 150 or so industry associations, the most negative ones tend to be concentrated in the US and Canada, which might speak to a little bit why the U.S. has had a little bit more trouble passing ambitious climate policy, unlike some countries in Europe. When we talk about lobbying at Influence Map, we're using a pretty broad definition. Lobbying, in its most strict definition, means meeting with policymakers or regulators and advancing a certain issue or outcome. But we think that Influence is bigger than that. It's promoting narratives, it's influencing public opinion, it's appealing to voters as well as policymakers. So again, I have another kind of inverted triangle here where we think of the sort of base level of discourse or public opinion on climate. So that could be as simple as gas is good. And that's a really powerful message that people can start to believe. From there, it becomes easier for industry or um, industry interests to shape the climate policy agenda if they have sort of managed to lay that foundation of gas is good or whatever it is, and then get into the even more detailed work like specific budgets or regulations or standards. What we see as we track these companies and industry associations over time is that they're really, really strategic. They will pick their moment and they might do all of these different things at once. They might be advancing certain narratives or appealing to people at the same time that they are lobbying policymakers, but they know what they're doing. And 
in a way that is actually encouraging, we can learn from them because this can be used as a force for good as well. So just to get a little bit more into the specifics, because that was all quite broad, we tend to do an annual or maybe every few years an analysis of the fossil fuel sector specifically and the oil majors. What we find is that they are putting so much effort into their public messaging, not just their detailed policy lobbying. They really care what people think. And they will spend hundreds of millions of dollars per year just to shape their public image. And when we look at those messages, which are across you know, social media or advertising or um, press releases or anything, anything that we can find that's public where they're trying to reach people, the vast majority of their messaging is trying to present them as aligned. They want people to think that they are with the energy transition, they're behind it, they're for it, and they're supporting it. In reality, when we actually look at their business plans, they're not. Uh, under 12% of their planned activity is actually dedicated to low carbon. And that would be their definition of low carbon, actually. So really, it's probably even less because they might include something as low carbon that we wouldn't necessarily say that it is. And at the same time, that they are promoting these messages of industry being aligned with the, the, with the energy transition, they're also advocating or lobbying in a way that really isn't supportive of most of the climate policy on the table. So that's sort of a, a negative note to end on, but I will come back and show you the companies that are doing the complete opposite and they are absolutely in line with the energy transition and, and advocating as such. But just to go into a bit more detail on anti-ESG, I'll pass over to Cleo. Thank you, Kendra. And yeah, thanks so much for Richard and Joanne for having us on today. I'm, I'm very happy to be speaking with everybody on Earth Day. Um, yes, unfortunately, I have some negative uh, pieces to, to continue with, but um, like Kendra said, it'll it'll swing more positive towards the end of our, our presentation. But um, so you may or may not be familiar or have seen headlines like the one on these um, slides. Um, but essentially what this is dealing with, the so-called anti-ESG movement is basically an umbrella term for uh, now years long multifaceted campaign to discourage climate action in the financial sector. So we've seen hundreds of headlines like the ones on this slide um, and ESG as a term has been transformed and used by its opponents to mean anything from climate action to fossil fuel discrimination to un-American. And um, we've, we've seen a lot of this and, and it's not, it doesn't seem to be slowing down. Um, but the current state of the anti-ESG movement really, like Kendra touched on earlier, shows the power of communications and influencing tactics of the fossil fuel industry. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Thanks, Kendra. Um, yeah, so to understand how we got to the sort of current landscape of anti-ESG, it's useful to go back to 2020. Um, the world was in the midst of the pandemic, oil prices were lower, policymakers were implementing more climate policies and the Biden um, election in November signaled sort of a more climate conscious administration coming in. Um, we saw financial institutions raise their own climate ambition following international agreements on climate and pressure from advocacy groups and campaign groups. Um, so because of this, the fossil fuel project production chain was feeling pressures on multiple fronts and they began to mobilize. Next slide. Um, so about three years ago, we sent out some freedom of information requests, and we got some documents back that showed um, that the very first anti-ESG legislation was drafted by and given to policymakers by fossil fuel lobbyists. So we obtained emails from February 2021 um, that showed that the West Virginia Coal Association emailed a draft of a bill to West Virginia Delegate Zach Maynard. 
Um, this draft was written by lobbyists from Alliance Resource Partners, which was formerly Alliance Coal. Um, the West Virginia Coal Association also sent over its 2021 legislative program, which has as a priority countering the ESG force. Um, in the program, it also says the West Virginia coal industry is in a state of decline following the global pandemic with a new president and federal administration committed to take America to a zero carbon economy. West Virginia is destined to be penalized for its fossil energy output. Um, and I'll just say here, if any of you are interested in seeing any of these documents, um, any of these emails, I like and would be happy to share them and I'll put my email in the um, chat and can follow up with you if you if you'd like to see the the firsthand documents. Um, so we see then in March 2021, uh, Delegate Maynard introduces the legislation. Um, and if we could go to the next slide, we'll see what that looks like. The language here, um, we see the word discrimination employed, and this is something that comes up frequently throughout the, the anti-ESG movement, but discrimination of producers of gas, um, coal, oil, et cetera. Um, and so although this specific bill doesn't end up passing. Um, Texas does pass a almost identical bill in June of 2021. And then West Virginia goes on to pass its own um, bill, uh, the same kind of bill the next year in March 2022. Um, so yeah, just to kind of give an idea of the the web of groups and actors that, that emerge um, in this movement, uh, throughout the FOIA documents, we see um, people from the State Financial Officers Foundation, um, which is described as sort of the, the ALEC or the American Legislative Exchange Council version for state treasurers, state comptrollers. Um, we also see uh, the Texas Public Policy Foundation's Life Powered Initiative. Um, TPPF is a conservative think tank and its Life Powered Initiative was born out of opposition to the clean power plan in the Obama era. Um, and again, we see this language of discrimination being being employed here. And, you know, the definition is bullying corporations and investment firms into divesting from from fossil fuels. Um, so this is this is from that those 2021 emails. Um, and if we could go to the next slide, we also see that TPPF has sort of laid the early foundations for the ESG as a violation of antitrust argument that goes on to crop up um, in, in recent subpoenas and investigations from um, both state level and federal policymakers. Um, and this was a white paper that was written by C. Boyden Gray, who um, was a sort of lobbyist that has a history of defending Exxon and um, sort of attacking climate related regulations. And DSmog has a great profile on him um, so just very interesting to see that they, they sort of, they laid the groundwork for all these things that we're seeing now. Um, and yeah, so again, since, since the first, um, anti-ESG bill was introduced, there's really been just a ton of different kinds of bills introduced at primarily at the state level. Um, and Pleiades has a tracker of this legislation that's super useful. They show the status of these bills and kind of group them into different categories based on what exact language they're using. Um, so like I said, yeah, different types different types of bills have emerged, but the, the end goal of all of them is really discouraging the use of ESG factors in financial decision-making. Um, so different types include limits on the choices that pension fund managers can make, limits on which financial institutions state funds can be invested with, um, prohibitions on use of ESG or social credit scores, restricting insurers from using climate in their risk assessments, which is kind of, you know, that's that's a key part of insurance business model um, or banks lending decisions, and also passing resolutions of disapproval on federal climate action. Um, and so these all look a, a bit different, but but with the same sort of end goal. Um, and if we can go to the next, thanks, Kendra. Um, so yeah, so you see the, like the uh, initial, the initial anti-ESG bills were quite targeted at individual financial institutions. Um, so we still see that with restricted lists coming out of these bills in various U.S. states. 
Um, there have been billions of dollars divested from BlackRock by other um, states sort of unilaterally. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, there have been investigations into antitrust violations at BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, um, asserting that membership in, in global um, sort of climate coalitions is an example of collusion. Um, and we've seen this in Texas, and we've also seen this at the um, US Congress level. Um, but it's the, the, the target has expanded also to um, include attacks on government policy, specifically things like the recent rule um, put forward by the SEC, which would require companies to report on their climate risk and some of their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we've seen lawsuits against this rule from um, both you know, Republican elected officials, but also um, industry groups like the US Chamber. Um, and so it really sort of spans um, it's coming from it's coming from different different angles. Um, we've also seen pressure on the Federal Reserve to limit their climate action and opposition to federal financial regulatory nominees because of their climate credentials. So um, that's like a, a critical a critical area where where this attack has been sort of successful. Um, and lastly, we've seen anti ESG affect broader climate ambition. So. Um, attacking the Global Financial Alliance for Net Zero or the Climate Action 100 effort as examples of collusion um, and questioning banks' membership in these groups like the Net Zero Banking Alliance. Um, we've seen financial institutions' own policies being rolled back. So the Bank of Montreal um, made its own coal policy less ambitious after West Virginia let it know that it was potentially going to be on its restricted list. Um, and after they rolled that policy back, they were not placed on the list. Um, and we've also seen anti-ESG emerging as a sort of concern or an excuse in other regions um, and a reason to limit ambition when it comes to climate action um, from financials themselves. Um, and yeah, so this slide sort of it's a bit co complex of a graphic, but this looks at specifically that second branch, the attacks on government policy. Um, and it also shows how successful anti-ESG proponents have been at aligning and injecting their anti-ESG priorities into policy priorities brought forward by representatives and also um, industry priorities um, that have sort of dominated lobbying by not only financial trade associations, but cross-sector associations and energy associations themselves. Um, but this graphic comes from a, a briefing from October 2023 that we released looking at the House Anti-ESG Month. And um, as you can see, like all of these priorities on, on the right-hand side there are um, efforts by the federal government to mainstream climate risk into, into financial regulation, and they've been sort of attacked um, or opposed at every um, every turn by both industry and, and um, elected officials um, that are opposed to this effort. Um, so now we can bring it back to the fossil fuel sector where we started. Um, as Kendra sort of described, we've we've had a long history of, of tracking the, the industry's tactics, um, but we know that their playbook is collaborative. So they rely on companies, industry groups, lobbying groups, think tanks to take up the take up the, the charge. And this kind of um, this extends into the second point, which is influencing the influencers. So taking the messaging that they develop to politicians and media and having having that translate there. Um, and the last one, which is just pretty super evident in a lot of this messaging is deflecting the issue of climate away from science and business risk to a political issue, a, one of belief in American values and and uh, an issue in, in the culture war that really is not rooted in sort of, yeah, concern for, for the earth or um, even sort of risk to investments. Um, so 
all is not lost. And uh, if we can go to the next slide, we can see some some evidence of pushback on this, which is which is good. Um, we've seen actually a lot of state anti-ESG bills fail after um, opposition from state banking associations and state chambers of commerce. So, um, you know, there there is there is evidence of of industry groups pushing back on this. Um, and we also see opposition from pension funds that have been charged with divesting from the targeted companies. So um, I think actually just today I read a Bloomberg article about Oklahoma having to sort of rethink its anti-ESG law after the, the pension fund that is sort of mentioned here said the divestments and pullback from, from these companies would be inconsistent with its fiduciary responsibility. Um, and there have been studies into the increased cost for taxpayers following these laws. Um, there was, I think, one again today came out about the Oklahoma law, um, the raised, the raised costs because of decreased competition in the municipal bond market. Um, and we also saw a similar study come out of the Texas Association of Business, um, which is notable because its members include um, both Exxon and Chevron. So the fact that they're saying you know, this this is costly and these these laws might not be a good idea is pretty notable. Um, and we also saw the American Legislative Exchange Council, which again is tasked with um, developing sort of model policies for its state legislator members to go and take and introduce in other states. Um, they rejected a model anti-ESG bill um, after the American Bankers Association opposed the policy. Um, so you can kind of see the the divergence here between the, the financials and um, the sort of fossil fuel companies on the these policies. Um, so that's good. Um, however, there is more to do. And um, particularly with the election coming up, the Heritage Foundation, which is a conservative um, think tank has laid out a sort of manual for recommendations um, eh, for the next sort of administration. And in that manual, it specifically calls for a reversal of climate related financial um, risk agenda and calls on Congress to roll back a lot of these climate conscious financial regulations that have started and been sort of you know, they've been started, but there's a lot more to do. And and Project 2025 would, would call for halting that. Um, it also says that, um, you know, the Department of Labor should consider following the lead of several states and bring enforcement actions against these asset managers for for their ESG policies um, as a breach, breach of fiduciary duty. Um, so there is definitely room for positive voices to step up and and counter this. Um, and maybe here I will pass back to Kendra for um, a rundown of what exactly that stepping up can look like. And I'll take a look at the chat and see if there's any questions I can answer in the chat. There we go. Great, so um, ending on a positive note, for Earth Day, <laughs> this is um, this is what a typical influence map graphic that we like to show as both evidence of and a call for movement by companies into climate policy leadership. So this um, every every dot on here represents a company in the U.S. Um, that we have assessed, and what we've done is plot them for how their climate policy engagement, which is the x-axis and then how active they are in their climate policy engagement on the y-axis. So if they're more towards the right, they're positive. And if they're up high, they are active. Companies that are on the left and um, also quite high, so in this, I think you can see my cursor, in this upper left quadrant, tend to be from the energy sector, as you can see with the blue here, fossil fuel companies that are actively strategically opposed to the transition. But we have a lot of companies that are moving over to the right and up top where they are actively strategically in support of the climate transition. Every year we do an analysis of the corporate leaders in climate policy engagement. And last year, this 
uh, this grouping of companies grew significantly. It almost doubled. So there are more and more companies that are embracing the transition in their climate policy advocacy. Granted, a lot of these companies are in Europe, but there are some in the US as well. They tend to be from, um, for example, the information technology sector, where they have committed to decarbonizing and they really need policy to help them get there, um, as well as utilities for a similar reason, providing electric power and um, can see the writing on the wall and want to transition and support policy to get there. There are also companies in the consumer sector, for example, Unilever, that um, regardless of their own operational plans have really taken up this issue and actively support climate policy and also actively call out industry associations that are blocking it. There are so many resources out there, particularly for investors and other stakeholders on how to push companies to be better in climate lobbying, um, including the global standard for responsible climate lobbying. That being said, um, some of those resources are really long and really complex. <laughs> so we have kind of distilled some key points here to what we think aligns with the global standard, but also can be a little bit more actionable to take to companies. So the first step one is what we say getting C-suite buy-in. A lot of companies, they're, they're positive and active climate policy advocacy comes from their sustainability team. And that's okay, but it's not quite as powerful as some of the fossil fuel companies who have completely synced up with their regulatory affairs and their CEOs and have a lot more power as a result. So we, we think that syncing up the regulatory affairs with the sustainability people at the company and getting the CEO to take up the issue is the foundational step. Step two is just following the science. At Influence Map, we um, pull from the, international, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for its guidance on what the transition looks like and how to get there. Um, and those resources can be used by companies as well to plan their advocacy and plan their approach. Um, a, a next one and a really simple one is reviewing their own climate policy advocacy. So what are they doing so far? Sometimes companies don't know. We, we tell them that they're, that they're a member of an industry group and they're completely surprised. They had no idea that they were a member. They've just been making these payments for years and it's a surprise to them. So that review process can be really important for laying the groundwork for step four, which is, okay, now that we know what we're really doing and what our different teams are up to and what industry groups we're a member of, we can start to take some action. And then step five is following the, the full range of engagement tactics that are available to a company. So we, we've seen, and, and as both Cleo and I have referenced, there's so many different engagement channels. There's, you know, social media and there's meetings with policymakers and there's um, other sort of public facing communications and letters and advertising, the whole gambit. And the companies that are most effective are using more than just one avenue to levy their interests and their position. I'm going to stop there. Um, there is much to be done in this space and um, there's a lot of reasons for hope. We're seeing more and more companies embrace this. Um, public opinion is shifting at the same time, um, but I see a, a lot of questions in the chat. So um, we've got plenty of time for questions. So I think I will stop there and I can reopen the slides if, um, if we need to go back to any particular content. So I'd like to open with one question and then um, I've been following the, the questions in the chat. Uh, but do you think that the dollars, the overall dollars devoted to anti-climate transition has increased or are we seeing sort of similar dollars, but the, the new layer is the addition of the legislative efforts? I don't know if Kendra or Cleo wants to take that one. It's a good question. And we don't actually track specific, um, like we don't track the specific dollar flows to either um, sort of, you know, campaign committees or or politicians themselves. Um, but I would just, I would imagine that 
it's probably increased as, um, you know, these industry groups get bigger and as sort of the, the threat of um, policy to, um, you know, cut back on, on um, sort of fossil fuel producing activities becomes even more imminent. Um, I would suspect that they're not stopping that and, and just ramping it up probably more. So one question was, how much greenwashing do you think there is, uh, you know, is this really prevalent? And because the work that Church Investment Group does is in uh, faith-based environmental social governance investing, I will just start that the answer to that question, which is it's important to look under the hood and see, I mean, there are, are ostensibly fossil fuel free indexes, and then you look in and you've got Chevron Exxon. So that's obviously the index is not walking the walk. Um, but I think there are managers out there. I will give you an example for, uh, for example, Pernassus, which is a large cap uh, stock manager whose performance has matched the S&P 500 over the years. And they ask their companies and look at their companies to see, do they have a science-based target? So 80% of their portfolio does. They have 55% less emissions than the S&P 500. Although I understand that that can also be, if you exclude a sector, you're going to have less emissions. But I, I think um, greenwashing exists. Um, and it is important to to analyze your choices. But in general, if a firm has a long history of um, Boston Common, many other uh, firms uh, are very active in um, in this sector in engagement. Uh, um, so, but I will turn it to uh, Kendra and Cleo for their their sense of greenwashing. Yeah, Joanne, I totally agree. I think that's exactly right. Um, and the tricky part is that there's no real regulations around um, sort of what funds have to label themselves as and what they should be including. Um, so, uh, yeah, like you said, it's kind of it's kind of left to the diligence of who's managing the fund um, and regulation is actually a, a pretty important part of this. Um, but no, I, I agree. There's been some, you know, enforcement a couple enforcement actions brought by the SEC for misleading claims on around ESG funds, but uh, by and large, I think it's it's really about communicating what you want your money to be going toward with your investment advisor, and that is actually a, a pretty good way to push back on a lot of this anti-ESG messaging. Um, so I've said with my own my own financial person, I want my money going towards going towards things that will help the climate. Um, and if they hear that from a lot of people, then it just sort of strengthens that demand um, and shows that that is something that investors are are asking for. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely agree. And greenwashing is a critical sort of area that needs a lot more regulation and, and beyond funds, but you know, how companies are marketing themselves in advertising and things like that. Um, it's very, very important. So another question was about um, environmental literacy for, for parishes. Um, I will recommend, I just did Al Gore's climate reality training in New York City, 3,000 people. And the exciting thing was that um, the bulk of the folks were under 40, which is ne the next generation. Uh, and so it, um, all kinds of information about the reality of the climate issues um, and charts showing, you know, the historical range of temperatures was here and now it's here and now it's here. Um, and so if folks can undertake that, I would, um, I would certainly highly recommend it. It is, I think, a bit of a challenge um, for education in our parishes I know I live in a purple part of the world, um, and I spoke yesterday about what we were doing in church uh, with our investments for our parish. Um, and it is balancing, not alienating folks. Um, I see it as an incredible crisis. That's why 
we are here at EPN sharing this, this information. Uh, but I, I recognize that this is not an easy topic to discuss from the pulpit, um, particularly um, in jurisdictions where uh, you're you're trying to knit together uh, disparate uh, views. One interesting point that uh, Climate Reality made uh, is that the emphasis, this behind the scenes lobbying has tended to, to shift away from the fact about is there climate uh, change to there are no solutions or the solutions are economically damaging or um, carbon capture, which is not likely to be among the most uh, effective um, approaches. So with that, I don't know if if you, Kendra and Cleo, have particular climate literacy resources that you'd like to share with folks, besides obviously delving into what Influence Map does. <laughs> I don't. It's a good question, and I'm sure that the groups that we that we um, partner with, um, so ICCR might like have some some resources there as well. Um, but uh, I, I did see that Sherry asked to read the the whole question here, which is unusually large temperature fluctuations and increased susceptibility to illness is a poignant reminder of how interconnected our health is with the Earth and her cycles. Can we advise on environmental literacy and reports that could include our parishers and also youth? Yeah, I think that's 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 a great way to phrase it. Um, and I think you know those resources would be helpful for myself as well. Um, and I will I will go about looking for them. Well, and the the national uh, the church center has is active in creation care. Um, they have uh, publications and information. Um, and I know that that many dioceses and parishes have uh, deeply rooted committees that are um, that are engaged. Uh, there's a wonderful book, Catherine Hayhoe, Saving Us. Uh, and initially, I was a little bit skeptical about that book because, um, but it really says talk to people about uh, climate change and things that they care about. That their fishing hole is is struggling or. Uh, there's been fires in the places that they like to hike to to get to people's uh, emotional response um, rather than um, more of an intellectual uh, response. I, I, we need both. Um, and I am working backwards. I don't know, Kendra or Cleo, if there are other questions that we are that we are missing here uh, in terms of responding to folks. Um, I know one um, one question that I'd like to ask, have you seen an increase in advertising on the positive side of the fence, um, organizations reaching out to counterbalance a lot of the information that is coming from the fossil fuel companies? It's a really good question, and I do think, I'm not sure if we're seeing evidence of that yet, but I do think that's something to strive for because advertising is really powerful, and I'm also scrolling up and trying to um, read as many of these as, as possible, and I think there is something in in the chat about advertising companies. Um, advertising companies will, you know, take on their highest paying clients, and sometimes these are fossil fuel companies. Um, there is a movement that we partner with to try to see some change in accountability in some of these PR or advertising firms. So that can be other clients, for example, saying that we maybe we don't want to work with you anymore if you're going to continue to take on um, all of this, this fossil fuel work. Um, it's always a question of, of cost. We, you know, the, the other side may not ever put, have the same dollars and the same funding to put into reaching people and advertising as much as the fossil fuel industry. But that being said, I still think um, understanding the risks of, of industry greenwashing through advertising is powerful enough in itself because then people are informed and they can see that, um, that 
companies are um, trying to convince them in a certain way. And that, that is, in itself is empowering, even if they're not seeing the, the contrasting messages. I just saw a message in the chat that says I can hardly hear Kendra. So I hope, I'm hope I'm coming through. <laughs> okay. Um, and a comment about um, investments. And that is where Church Investment Group spends a lot of its time. Happy to share resources with folks um, about thinking about whether what you are doing with your investments lines up with what you are saying in the pulpit. And that is not just on environmental issues. Uh, and I think, uh, as I believe Cleo touched on, there's a lot of academic evidence to show now that faith-based investing is equally profitable uh, or comparably profitable to a traditional traditional approach. Um, wanted to uh, just touch on uh, Church Investment Group is a member of the Interfaith Center for Corporate Responsibility, ICCR. And one of the committees that I serve on is the lobbying committee. And I have to say, before I joined it, I really did not have a sense of the depth of efforts that the Chamber of Commerce, um, the Manufacturing Association, is putting into pushing back on climate regulation. And simultaneously, the corporations that are members are um, uh, espousing and, and adopting science-based uh, approaches to their own corporate op operations. And think about it, the insurance companies largely understand that climate change is a real financial risk to them. So, but it's a very amorphous uh, area. Kendra and Cleo, do you have any, beyond proxy voting, which I recommend to people, talk to your investment app manager, ask how are they proxy voting? Are they proxy voting? Um, how do you recommend to people that uh, they can help address uh, this um, lobbying influence uh, that is going on? It's a good question. It's a big, it's a big problem. And there's a whole, you know, issue of money in politics that is kind of, you know, difficult to figure out how to solve and where to start. Um, but I think like starting at the, the local level is probably the most accessible way um, to go about this. So, you know, just for an example with these ESG bills, if you visit the, the site where the, where this tracker is, um, uh, that's linked in the in the PowerPoint. Um, and if you see that one of these bills has been introduced in your state and it's a state where you can go and register um, to speak on the bill or just register in in opposition to the bill um, or find local chapters doing work um, around policies like this, I think that's a pretty useful way to um, put put forward your your voice. Um, and I know somebody mentioned in the chat that, yeah, what if you don't have a ton of investments to direct one way or the other, um, then this is kind of a, another good way to take action. Um, yes, I will put the, the link for the tracker in the chat, um, but that's kind of some, some initial thoughts there. So someone was asking, which auto company is it on the upper right? That was probably Tesla. <laughs> I mean, I was going to say, I was guessing. Um, and uh, someone commented about the fact that it is rather ironic that um, that typically Republican legislatures are trying to shut down freedom of making your own investment choices. No one insists that um, a, a state or a, a pension take climate risk into their analysis. It is simply saying, we think it's worthwhile to include these these factors um, in our our considerations of investments or companies um, considering it in their in their plans. So, uh, and I think um, so. I think we are we are coming down on time. Cleo and Kendra, do you see any questions we have we have not uh, um, uh, addressed? I I will note that we have. Um, a gentleman, uh, Larry Abel from Impact Cubed, a London-based company, uh, has joined us. 
And that is the group that uh, Church Investment Group works with to assess our portfolios because very important to me, if parishes and dioceses are making these efforts, what difference is it making in the real world? And we're looking to track what our portfolio is doing against the benchmark. Now, I recognize the benchmark is not the, you know, the be all end all of the, the real world, but it's it's important not only to, to make the choices, but then to look through and hopefully see how we are actually shifting the reality um, because it is a very concerning reality. Uh, listening to the, the state of the coral reefs over the weekend was uh, was uh, was very very concerning um, among many uh, biodiversity issues. Uh, this presentation will be shared with everybody who registered. The tape of the um, of the uh, our conversation today uh, will also be shared. And we thank uh, you all for taking the time to to join us and celebrate Earth Day. Uh, it is they say it goes back to. Uh, uh, 1970s, really the birth of the environmental movement. And it's one of the biggest secular celebrations uh, on the planet. Over a billion people will do things today. You've done your bit, um, but we felt it is also important to, to tie it to our faith tradition uh, of creation care. So we, I'm going to make sure that uh, there are no more questions here, but I think we are uh, winding, uh, winding down to, to the end. So thank you very much, Kendra, Cleo. I recommend their, their work. Uh, there are so many levels and layers, um, and some of the opposition by fossil fuel companies goes back to science denial in the eighties. And it's a sophisticated, well-financed effort that is still uh, as they both noted, more active here in the U.S. And um, there are very significant real-life considerations and financial considerations for us. So thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, go embrace Mother Earth. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, everyone.